Uh, all right, so this is 701 Podcast. This is our first uh, episode. We're here with our uh, fitter, master fitter, Philip Fortenberry. Um, we're basically doing this podcast just to bring some knowledge to kind of what's going on in the community, um, things going on around our shop, and uh, just having a little fun with it. So, Philip, thank you for, for doing this. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure I give you a choice. I kind of give you a choice, but appreciate you coming on. So, what is what is your role here? What 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 are you doing, and why is what you do important? So, thanks for having me on. Uh, first off, I'm the master bike fitter. So, you know, I I build bikes custom to the rider, the rider's needs, the rider's limitations, physical limitations, anatomical limitations flexibility limitations, and also to the event. So if it's a full Ironman, half Ironman, you know, sprint race versus an endurance race, the position would be different. So that's how I build the bikes, but also there's people with specific needs as as a, maybe an injury or pain, or if someone buys a new bike, then I can take their old measurements and put those measurements onto their new bike. Or if someone likes to ride two or three bikes and they don't want their fits to be too far off, then I can, I call it mimicking. So I'll take the measurements and make all the bikes very similar. Yeah. And, and, and you've helped me out before the injury. Um, I had some knee issues quite a few years ago and, and we spent quite a bit of time assessing those and I haven't had knee injury and or knee issues in years now. So it's, it's something that the shop truly believes in and uh, you've gotten some big names around the community that come to you for fits now and guidance on, on how their bike fits. So um, it's been a, it's been an awesome thing to watch, to mm-hmm. grow. Um, yeah. So you've, uh, you have a pretty interesting story on how you came into bikes. Um, I kind of want to briefly go over that as well, but um, you originally served in the army straight out of high school, correct? Correct. Actually, the Marine Corps. Marine Corps. Right out of high school, and then I went to the army mm-hmm. eight years later. Yep. And you were uh, you became an instructor. Mm-hmm. Yep. I taught marksmanship for the small arms readiness group. We trained approximately fifty thousand during that time. Sure. And now you're you're getting back into kind of the shooting competition side of things. Yep. I've been competing a little with pistol because it's always been a struggle for me. I'm always I've always been better with a rifle, so I'm trying to improve on. Um, precision pistol. Sure, sure. Yeah, so that's been super cool. Um, you know, your your bicycle journey kind of starts after you got out of the military, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, so do you want to tell us a little bit about that story? Yep, sure. So I got out of the military after teaching marksmanship and I was a little burnt out on it. Also, I wasn't taking care of myself. I was smoking cigarettes and drinking so i decided i wanted to bicycle across america and i didn't own a bicycle so i flew to seattle washington took a bus and a train and a taxi and made my way up to anacortes washington which is the start of the northern tier and purchased my first road bike and the first day i went nine miles it was four miles from the bike shop to the beach and then four miles back to the bike shop to add to my care package I was sending home. I brought too much stuff and had a difficult ride to the ocean with it. And, um, and then I camped one mile from the bike shop. And then uh, three and a half months later, I was in Bar Harbor, Maine. Yeah, yeah. And along the way, you, you uh, stopped in this little state of North Dakota. That's uh, true, yep. Yep, and you fell in love with uh, Oil Town. Yep, that's how I ended up uh, living in North Dakota was... Um, it was it was eye opening the opportunities that people were taking advantage of. You know, and you hear, you know, people complain throughout throughout your life about their situation and they're not willing to make the changes. And so when I saw these people, you know, making taking that taking advantage of those opportunities, it was it was very uh, motivating. Sure. So I decided to move out and be a part of that. Sure. So because um, you're originally from Mississippi. Yep, I was born in Mississippi. And then uh, I did uh, finished uh, middle school, high school in uh, Atlanta, and then joined the Marine Corps right out of high school. So you've traveled quite a bit of this country between you know everything you've done. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and Northern Tier is definitely no uh, small task riding mm-hmm. across the, the upper part of our country. Um, so that's kind of kind of how your bike story began. Um, and you actually met your wife riding bikes as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I was living in a man camp in Williston for two years. And I was just cycling every day, all day, as much cycling as I could get in. Because um, I just didn't want to go backwards. I felt like I had a re renewed life and I just wanted to keep that momentum so I was riding all the time and um, uh, I, I signed up for Candisk and that's where I met Lori so she was I met her on the fourth day so it was a century mile day I remember very well it was a, a challenging day and there were a lot of people sagging as a strong headwind and so she was a strong rider I was impressed so. yeah yeah now you guys you guys it's something you guys bond over now mm-hmm. um i meant you've traveled all over the world riding tandem together yep um you know you just came back from new zealand what it was a couple months ago now maybe a month ago it was december 27th i think i got back or yeah it was like right before that december 23rd sure so yeah about a month ago yeah i mean you guys i mean every year you take one two trips right yeah um just tandeming around different countries and experiencing different cultures yep we read tandem so it's a it's a lot of fun you know me touring i'm not into the speed i'm more into the the logistics and the camping and i don't know it's just not a so it's not a big deal for me to be on a tandem which which may climb a little slower but it descends very fast so it's just not a for me i'm comfortable at those speeds Mm -hmm. yeah no that's that's awesome what what uh I think I know the answer, but what what has been the most memorable travel that you've had thus far on a tandem? On the tandem, I would say Vietnam and Cambodia. Those are my uh, favorites. The roads, um, the people, uh, just it felt safe. Um, Very exotic, the food. So that was my favorite trip. Sure, sure. And you guys are taking off for Japan. That's your next trip. Yep, Um, next is Japan in June. And you guys learned Japanese for this trip. Yep, know? we've been uh, studying Japanese. We hired a, um, a Japanese student, uh, exchange student, for six months, and then she left. So now we're on our own studying what she's left us with. Sure. But we'll visit her in Japan, and I have some friends that I used to, I, I knew when I lived in Japan. So we're going to visit some friends. So world traveling, fit, um, and you guys even do state travels as well. You you've ridden across the state multiple places mm-hmm. um i know down to wishick was one of the rides mm-hmm. um, and you've ridden out to medora as well mm-hmm. so yeah we'll leave from bismarck and do a seven day ride or 10 day ride and go and do just just camping along the way just bike bike away from home and you know uh, 10 days later you get back to home so yeah. it's a lot of fun yeah you've you've taught me a lot about camping and and stealth camping, as you like to call it. Yeah, my wife doesn't like stealth camping. <laughs> Bib sacks and whatnot. Yeah, she doesn't like Bib sacks. Yeah, well... She likes a three-man tent, so she has room for reading a book and standing up. Yeah, a little bit a little bit <laughs> more... Uh, Comfort. More comfortable. Yeah. Still, it's still pretty uh, basic, for, especially for people that, you know, aren't used to camping, but... Yeah. Nonetheless, you know, biv sack is just you and Yeah, that's the way I did it across America. It was a biv sack and is a camouflage system so I could I could camp anywhere, mm-hmm. you know, low profile, low silhouette. So, that's how I bicycled across America though. Yeah. Hmm. Do you have any inkling to ever ride across America again? Oh, yes, definitely. Lori and I uh talk about it often. Um she'd like to do it as well. So, there's a lot of other routes to take, so we don't have to repeat the northern tier but sure. the lewis and clark trail the underground railroad the southern tier there's just a lot of uh, famous rides around america sure yeah so you've uh i know you've consulted with a few people trying to help them get you know their touring stuff in order as well so mm-hmm. um and, and something else that we've done too is a couple of years ago, and, and you've been doing it a lot longer than anybody here, but you even rode all the way through the winter from your house to get here. Yep, I Which did. is, what, it's like nine miles? Seven miles? Seven, I think it's 7.1. Seven miles? Yeah. So, so rode all the way through the winter, no yeah. matter the temp, in Bismarck, North Dakota. Yep, I've done it a few years. This year I've been in a league of shooting, so it's really hard to make. Um, it's, it's tough to do everything, so it's a challenge. You know, I need to get more balance, but yeah, I've been shooting in a league through the winter, and... Basically, it's a, it's taken a lot of my time in the evenings. So, what was the? I know my coldest temp. What was your coldest temp you've ridden? In? 
I think it was like with a windshield. With windshield. Without... I think we should count windshield. Okay, count windshield. That's, that's what makes it. Yeah. I think, you know. Um, I think it's like negative 60 with Dang. a windshield. Dang. Mine was negative 27 actual temp, so I don't know what oh, with yeah. windshield it was. But yeah. And it was it wasn't as bad as you thought it would be though. It's yeah. it's not as bad as people think. I know DJ just wrote an article on it, but um, you know people put away their bikes for for the whole winter, and it's like it's not that bad as long as you just get the basic gear to, to and make you, it bad. And it's like climatizing too. You just have to ride into it. You know, start off early. It'd mm-hmm. be tough if you weren't out there all year, and then all of a sudden you're going out in the coldest day. Yeah, if yeah, you're climatized, you know what to wear. You know how long. A, to leave in advance what the winds are doing so you just you know yeah work your way into it and you you have some system stuff that isn't even cycling specific that works for you so i mean it's not yeah not... i think i wore car hearts that one day <laughs> it was <laughs> actually really hard to it... cycle in oh i bet they killed my time stiff stiff <laughs> yeah i need to break those in. yeah and you even i mean i when i did it i rode on on bike pass all the way up here but you're you're on yeah. road without yeah. shoulder hardly so dodging the snow plows snow plows and yeah People I'd and, cross over and let the plow pass and then get back on my side. It was funny. <laughs> I think the plow driver was like, what the heck is he doing out here? Yeah. Yeah. You, you do a challenge to anything. Um, and you rode, you attempted the Mata 100, which I did. Dang. I think I made it like 75 and I don't know. I just, uh, thought I was going to die. Yeah. So well, and, and, <laughs> and anybody that knows you knows that mountain biking is not your forte, Yeah. but you attempted this thing anyway. Yeah. Um, in my personal experience on the Mata Hay, I, it's gotten a lot better, but back in 08, before it was even groomed, you know, we raced 50 miles races all over the country and, and we got stuck out there and we had to get picked up. So kudos to you, man, for, for even attempting that thing. Yeah. But I, you, it was a hundred some degrees that day yeah. you rode it. It was super hot. Yeah. So but I saw some techniques that I could implement. This dude had his wife putting an ice wrap around his neck at the rest areas. And I was like, I should be doing that. Yeah. And he was also sitting in his car in the shade and I was just plopping down in a chair out in the sun and eating sure. a little bit. Just a little, I think some changes and I could do it, but. Oh yeah. I, you I know, bet obviously you could. I'm, painful i didn't finish that oh yeah do you, th- do you think at some point you'd go back <laughs> i don't know you don't know i don't know i know you got a lot on your bucket list that you yeah want to exactly done. i'm so busy with other stuff now so yeah huh yeah and you have you have how many cats now <laughs> too many too many <laughs> Three cats and one dog yep bubba all uh rescued rescue yep uh, you guys are very involved with uh yep. humane society yeah we are and making sure that animals uh are well taken care of yeah um so one other thing I wanted to to touch on um, in this podcast is kind of a little bit more into the fit side of things. Um, so we've we've been doing this. You've been with us for man over five years. Yeah, it's, I was gonna say six. Yeah. So you've been with us for a while, and and you came in knowing that you were gonna be our fitter. Yeah. Um, so we've sent you off to school quite a few times, but but kind of the evolution that we've come to with motion capture now, which is a yeah. uh, it's a diode system essentially that shows us exactly how the movements are happening on the bike. Um, talk a little bit about that and kind of where fit has come to where it was. So yeah, when I started, it was just a plumb bob and a goniometer and a level, you know, that's technically all you need as a fitter. And, and then we went to the next level. We, we purchased the retool move and that's a, like a tool, a bicycle tool that the rider will ride on and you can make quick changes to saddle height, fore and aft, uh, handlebar height. And so you can build different bikes without them getting off. You can, you know, a- a- apply changes without, without any waste of time. It's, it's very fast. And then I think we got that, um, maybe three years ago. And then after the year after that, we, we purchased the, uh, re- or the uh, motion capture system. And so that's what Colin was just talking about. The motion capture system shows movement in a three-dimensional plane. So it's not just angles of like your point of terminal extension, like your knee, you know, your, 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 your foot at the bottom of the pedal stroke, your knee angle at the bottom of the pedal stroke, but it's also showing the travel of your knee uh, laterally. And so as a fitter, you know, that's, that's something we work on with our eye, you know, visually is to, to, to remove that lateral movement, you know, which we want to try to stabilize the knee. So, so that's a, a tool that helps to, to um, you know, collect data with and also prove your your theories. So it's a, it's a very uh, nice tool. And then also, you know, I say collect data, but it's 
so so you get a fit in let's say 2020 you, your motion is captured for, for 2020 your your bike we also measure the bike now with the with that system so i previously would measure the bike with tape measure you know a level and so now I use a wand, and it's it's a infrared system that that measures within a millimeter, very accurate your bike's t your touch points, you know everything about your bike. And and so in 2020, I have all of that captured. And then later on, if you get a new bike, we can you know we can mimic the motion, we can mimic the the, the settings. Yeah, yeah. And and again, you've done it. How much you have to be at you know 300 plus fits now? I think it's it's a couple of hundred. I don't yeah. know exactly what it's at. Been but. quite a few, and and a lot of the people you fitted have had great success in their events now. You know, mm -hmm. um, they say I do more fits in in the region than any other fitter, yeah. and I attribute that to, you know, being in Bismarck. You'd think that, you know, there wouldn't be many people that need bike fits, mm -hmm. but the the difference is, is the people in this community, they or in in the surrounding communities. To travel to Bismarck is, is it seems like a long way if you live somewhere else, but for here it's not very far. And these mm -hmm. people don't want to go to the Twin Cities, or they don't want to go to you know they don't want to go to the big cities. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to the big cities, there's like multiple fitters. Whereas in this area, I'm the only uh, master certified fitter, so I'm just you know always always busy that way. Always busy, always staying busy. Um, and you can hopefully soon be able to book with you on our website if people are interested in. And getting into fit or you know if you're in the area and you want to stop by and take a look at everything we we're talking about here um or pick your ear you're here till normally two three o'clock ish mm -hmm. um but they can stop by and, and talk to you about that and see if we can help them out in some way shape or form um well i appreciate you coming on um i guess is there anything else you want to to throw in nope that's it no i that's appreciate it, it. thanks yeah. for having me yeah man we'll uh we'll uh try to do these monthly so if you guys enjoyed this podcast uh check back on youtube or soundcloud i'll try to link this a couple different places but we're uh we're gonna keep doing these we'll do some more with uh our staff a little bit and then some other influencers in the community as well as some professionals i might have lined up along the way so um definitely stay tuned and we appreciate you guys tuning in